let's start, Dale, today with your background. Um, as an iconic model in the 1970s and 80s, you represented all sorts of top makeup brands, L'Oreal, Estee Lauder, Max Factor, and Revlon. And I know you appeared on over 100 covers, um, Sports Illust- Illustrated in their swimsuit issue, and among many, many, many other achievements. Can you tell our listeners, as a young model, how did you cultivate self-confidence? Hmm. Self-confidence comes with experience and time. You know, it, it, you, it, if you're extremely fortunate and you've had, you know, been affirmed, you know, and not bumped into any limitations or criticisms or something like that, and I don't think very few people out there have that happen, then you might sail into life, you know, in the early years, the young years, um, super sure of yourself. I think as a young person, you're always not sure, but I think that the passion or the drive overrides your insecurity. I think we're all a little afraid when we start something we don't know, we're a little new at it. So I think that that's the battle, if you call it. Um, Not quite a battle, but that's the overcoming. Um, I still get afraid uh, or concerned or something like that. But it's also gets your batteries going and you get excited. And it, 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 you feel fantastic when you overcome your insecurities and your fear and you get affirmation for what you felt was the right thing to do, the passion for something to do that you wanted to do. Um, that is an incredible validation that starts to build and begin your personal development of self-confidence. But it takes time. You have to risk a little bit. You have to be afraid. You have to make phone calls you're not sure of. Um, sometimes I, I, I pick up the phone to dial somebody. I have no idea what I'm going to say. But I have a lot of confidence in my um what we call your own personal Shakti, your own personal energy. So I like face-to-face interviews because I I feel my energy mixed with that person's energy will make something happen. And I always keep my focus. I tell my interns, don't focus, you know, don't take it personally. Just focus on what you want to get done. See the end result. You know, if you keep focusing on the end result, it doesn't matter that somebody said no. Um, It doesn't matter that somebody said that's, you know, you're focused on what, like when I wrote my book, people said, how do you write your book? I always saw the book finished. Mm -hmm. And so I was measuring while I was doing it, the finished product in my head, do you know? So you, if you really focus on what you want, it kind of offsets the voices inside you that say, you can't do this. Why you? Someone else can do it better. You know, how do you, who do you think you are? We have these little voices. I just tell them, all right, get in the back. <laughs> get in the back of the car I'm driving. There's only one driver, you know. <laughs> and and um, it, it works because I don't think you gain anything without a little fear. You have to walk through the fear and get to the other side. I love that. That's wonderful advice. And I think for those of us on the outside looking at the modeling industry, right? And they're such incredible, you know, um, standards for beauty. And it looks so effortless, you know, when you, on on this side and thinking about what you actually went through to be, you know, to have developed that tough skin um, and be able to handle setbacks or challenges or criticism. Can you speak to that a little bit? Yeah, that's really interesting. I don't think I've ever talked about this before, but you know, my career is so long. So I, I, uh, the, the, you know, 40 years or something in it. So I've been through a lot of, um, culture changes, regime changes, considerations of what was beautiful or not beautiful. There was only a, like a one type of beauty when I was start starting. So basically I was not considered model material. You know, I was very small. I had a little round face. I had curly hair, dark hair, dark. No, everyone wanted to be blonde, California, Swedish or Texan or California. You know, that was the look. You know, there was no ethnicity, very little ethnicity or uh, age, you know, differences, things like that. But and also but I think I had a lot of 
excitement and will and goodwill. And I think that served me well. I always, I think, was very nice to people, kind to people, picked up my clothes, hung things up. Um, and so I think that served me in the future. Kindness, I think, and um, thank you, saying thank you to people and thank you notes and things like that um, give, give, gave me a longevity. And I, there, you cannot underestimate um, thoughtfulness, uh, kindness, um, you know, just thinking about the other person rather than yourself. It, and when I started, I was kind of a teen model. So because I had been a dancer, I could kind of move and do things like that. And, but it was a little bit like mean girls, you know, in high school. <laughs> so, you know, the other models who were more established, a little bit had more sophistication, they would collect in one side of the room and I would go, hi, how are you? You know, I'm on stale, you know, and they went, no. <laughs> so it was, you know, it didn't, it didn't, um, in French, they say, bless, bless me, bless a, uh, it didn't wound me. It disturbed me, but it didn't wound me. And I, I still worked my way through it. And the fact of the matter is it's really funny because I had a vision of myself as a very sophisticated model, even though I looked cute, you know, not beautiful. I wasn't considered by, but cute, you know, oh, she's cute, you know, things like that. So I think I had to walk through the mean girl stage a little bit like high school, like I said, where uh, I was ostracized and shoved out and not considered their equal. So I, w I walked through that. I walked with as much grace as I could because, again, you just can't take it personally. That's what they think. And this is what I think. And I tested what called tested a lot. So I tested. Uh, I mean, you you have to build up a portfolio and bit by bit by bit, because you, when you have that strong vision in your head, there would be one photo that would convince one photographer, another photo. And then I kind of bypassed all those mean girls, do you know? And so, and then they kind of disappeared in the industry and I kept going and kept going. And the brass ring in modeling is always a makeup contract. You're doing everything. You have bread and butter work. That's like catalog and things that are, you know, not glamorous, but um, but they give you a lot of money. But the brass ring uh, is a is a makeup contract, and I was fortunate enough to have four of them. So usually you, you're lucky if you get one. So I was lucky enough, and I think it has to do something with communication because it's it's very intimate, it's close up, and women would write me and say, "I think you understand how I feel. I think you understand my problems." And so, and I had an understanding that beauty is not just about my skin. It really has to translate through my eyes, through the page, through the camera, you know, to the woman or the girl. And it was more about how I connected than how beautiful I was. And um, in terms of, I know you were the model that broke barriers for women over the age of four, uh, 35 when you became the global face of the, the new anti-aging line um, for Estee Lauder. So thank you for doing that. <laughs> and, oh, it's uh, not, you know, I was at 35. Well, <laughs> I was told by the industry that I was over the hill and finished at, at about that age. It's so just, I was like, whoa, we're just starting now, you know? <laughs> um so could you just explain um, for our listeners how you had the confidence to, to be that kind of a trailblazer for that in that time period? I know, like you said, over 35 was just, you know, I'm sure people told you that you were finished. Yes, the, in, the entire industry, even the, the, the ones in the know, because it, you, you got to think of also what we're used to now is not what was happening at the time. So a woman over 40 was, her products were imaged on a 20 year old who didn't need them. And it would just, I'm very logical. It wasn't logical. First of all, I felt, I felt that I hadn't reached my peak, so to speak. So I said, well, how can an industry tell me I'm over when I don't feel I'm over? So I said, I'm going to fight back. And I thought, this is a great opportunity for me to, from the inside of the industry, to change their perception of a multi-billion dollar industry. And so I went to the library, did a lot of research, and came out at, the, at that time that there were 43 million baby boomers and, and that 
we weren't being imaged. So basically the industry was saying, you're not worth it. Uh, you're invisible. Y you know, it was a subtle shove to the side of a whole of millions of millions of women. So I said, I think that, you know, I, when I get on something that feels truthful to me, I, d I never think I know, I, I, I know when a person says no, I don't think that no means no to me. All it means to me is that they don't understand yet. So it's up to me to digest it for them and present it in a way that they would understand that that's just my makeup and I'm logical and it doesn't make any sense to me that if a girl is beautiful, she should become a full woman beautiful. When we as women together have to decide together how and what is beautiful because you can't completely fight the wrinkle war and you don't want to because I don't want a blown out plastic perfect face, you know, maybe a little, <laughs> I <don't know. laughs> but I mean, um, so we have to do, um, define together that, uh, you know, what are the secrets and gifts that each age is bringing us instead of desperately holding on to the age we left. So, you know, I, I wrote two books. They're both bestsellers. Um, uh, Ageless Beauty, I think, is the first one, and The Five Principles of Ageless Living, because I just felt that there wasn't enough information for women about what is the beauty of moving along in life. How can it be beautiful? Like at this stage, I'm into philanthropy, and philanthropy – is part of generosity. And to me, that now folds into my definition of what is beauty. Beauty is also being generous. There, there's no question I worked with the most beautiful girls in the world physically. But I want to say to all the listeners out there, if somebody is gifted with great beauty, that's like a talent, like a musician or, you know, but it's up to the person to animate their beauty because there, it is such, it's as, as if you got a box wrapped so beautifully and you 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 look at the box with a beautiful bow and you undid it and there was nothing inside or a terrible mm -hmm. thing inside you know so it's not just physical beauty that makes somebody beautiful because have you noticed when you're with somebody that maybe isn't physically beautiful but their their soul the inside is so beautiful or animated or exuberant and you walk away and go, oh my God, that person is so beautiful. But beauty is very arbitrary and it really mixes. I, I think if you're very young, it mixes, you know, the inner with the outer skin. It has to mix together. The, the, the essence of the person has to come through your skin and through your eyes. I think if you're 20 years old, you have a grace period. You have a, because you're not expected to be wise or, you know, necessarily, or, you know, be phenomenal in your career, unless you're an exception. So you have time to develop, but basically uh, you have, a, I, I say a beautiful girl, a physically beautiful girl at any age has about a two minute grace period. And then she better deliver because the promise is so huge. Like, Oh my God, the person is so beautiful. Oh no, they're not at all. When they start opening their mouth. So I, I was around quite a few like that. So that, um, in a way, their insecurity was very pal palatable because they would consider I'm only as good as my skin and my eyes. I, I don't have anything inside. And for me, I guess, because I wasn't taken uh, for so much for the physical, it was much more about my personality um, and, and what I could communicate with, with the great photographers that that gave me my uh, hand up.